Hey, this is Michael Kramer. This is Sarah Nofke. Hey guys, this is Ernie Howard. Hey, this is Scott Moon, and you're listening to 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. We do have a great giveaway with this episode, but before I tell you about the giveaway... Let me tell you about our sponsor, The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. The Galactic Satori Chronicles, a thirst for revenge since one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye, and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship and then to the very planet of the enemy trying to destroy them. The Galactic Satori Chronicles can be found on Amazon where Book 1 Earth is only 99 cents and Book 2 Kron is 2.99. Head on over to Amazon and search for Galactic Satori Chronicles or head on over to legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, we will include a link where you can find both book one and book two on Amazon. And now for the giveaway that I was telling you about. This week, our guest is author J. Michael Wright II, and he has two ebook copies of his novel, The Spider's Web, the first book in his Talon series. What do you need to do in order to get registered to win one of the copies? It's simple. Head on over to legendarium.com, find the show notes for this episode, and let us know in the show notes what was your favorite part of the episode. It's as simple as that. Now enjoy our interview with author J. Michael Wright II. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest this week is J. Michael Wright II. Uh, Thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. Roll Tide and... Oh, oh man! All my darlings out there. <laughs> oh, we might have to I, end this one. I'm a Georgia fan. <laughs> oh, you're a Georgia fan. I am. Hey, hey, at least I'm not an Auburn fan. That's we're true. Semi neutral. That's we're, right. We're semi neutral of our hatred. <laughs> That's right. And plus, welcome you know, everyone. It's a Southern podcast. That's Things right. It's got real. We brought football into it. That's right. Two seconds in, it's about to get into a fight. I guess I have to like Auburn or Alabama since we have Kirby Smart as our coach. So. You're welcome. That's right. <laughs> he got out there. It's good to be here. <laughs> well, we like to start each episode here with a segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie, where you will tell me two truths and a lie about yourself, and I have to try to guess which one is the lie. So I'm going to see if I can keep my winning streak going. I started a one correct guessing winning streak last week. So let's see if we can keep that one going. What right. are your two truths and a lie? My true truths and a lie are I once made WWE Hall of Fame and hardcore wrestling legend Terry Funk cry. That is the first one. Okay. The second one, while on vacation in New Orleans once, I rounded the corner and and I just happened to run into Anne Rice as she was getting into a vehicle and leaving a public event. Oh, wow. Okay. The third one, I actually have been on stage with the Dropkick Murphys, and I got on mic and helped them sing the song, We'll Meet Again. Okay. Um, I saw you do a video online where you sang Fat Bottom Girls. So I'm going to assume that you like music and that you like the Dropkick Murphy. So I'm going to say that one's true. So I'm going to narrow it down 
to the you made Terry Funk cry or Anne Rice. Um, I want the Terry Funk one to be true just because that would be kind of a neat story. So I'm going to say the lie is you rounded a corner and ran into Anne Rice is the lie. You are actually correct. Yes. Keeping the wind streak going. <laughs> the wind streak going. Yes, I actually did. And the Terry Funk story, it was after an event. Uh, it was a great time. I actually got to hand him the chair for his match against Raven nice. in a local event in Birmingham. Oh, you're a wrestling fan. So there are some people that have no clue what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> They're like, what is this? <laughs> and uh, I happened to find the spot in the back where the boys were coming out after the show. And I stood around and waited. And Terry Funk came out. And everyone swarmed him. And then there was just this silent moment. And somehow... Everyone stayed quiet, and I got to just blurt out, Mr. Funk, I just want to tell you that you know when I figured out that you know what wrestling was and how the business worked and all the stuff that you have done to your body for to entertain me and the fans for all these years, I want to thank you for what you've done to yourself just to make us happy. And he literally, his eyes like welled up with tears, and I, I was just – I was awestruck. And then everybody else was like, oh, yeah, and what you did in Japan with the exploding matches and the – and, like, we actually made Terry start to tear up. And he left, and he, like, he was hugging people. And this is one of the toughest men, like, maybe on the planet. And I made him cry, and I was like, I had a moment with Terry Funk. There we go. <laughs> there we Kind of sound like me when I go to concerts. I like to hang around and try to get – a autographs and meet the bands it doesn't matter what concert i go to i try to figure out a way to uh meet the band somehow um oh yeah oh dropkick murphys or or man they were so friendly they actually stuck around after the last song um the the bass player which does about half the singing um he took i have pictures to prove it i have a picture with me on the mic with one of the guitar players on stage I have a picture with me and the ex-wife with the bass player and i even found a video uh online that someone filmed and posted on youtube where you can see me up on stage with a dropkick <laughs> and i was like that was a hell of a night that was a That's hell of a awful. night i've never had anything that cool happen at a show but you, you, you never know there, there's always tom so oh it'll happen keep going there yeah the uh the funniest story i've had is uh my wife is a big fan of a i guess they're country bluegrass they're called nickel creek um nickel. we we went to go see them in concert and i always get to shows hours before doors open and we were there and i was like well i'm gonna go around since we know where the buses are and there's no security. I'm just going to go back there and see if maybe I can find the band. And so as I'm walking back there, um, there's this guy standing near the buses just kind of standing there. And I was just – I walk up to him, and I was like, hey, you know, is the band inside? <laughs> and uh, he kind of looked at me, and he goes, um, well, a couple of them are. Why? And I was like, oh, you know, just want, want to meet him or whatever. And he's like, well – I'm I'm in the band. And I said, no, you're not. I, I I didn't really know who they were. I was like, no, you're not. He goes, yeah, I'm Sean Watkins. I was like, oh, well, hi, nice to meet you. Let me go get my girlfriend. And so I go around the corner, and I uh, I can't remember if we were just dating or engaged at this time. I was like, hey, uh, Sean Watkins is down here. She goes, shut up. I said, no, really, I just I just talked to him. I uh, told her what happened, and she comes. She we walk around there, walk around the corner. He's down there still. And she walks up to him. She goes, I'm so sorry for my ignorant boyfriend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the that's the funniest thing I've had happen at a show. So, Oh, that is great. Yeah. Well, for my listeners that might not know uh, kind of who you are or what you do, can you kind of give them the bio on uh, who you are and what you do? Well, uh I'm 43. I've lived in Alabama most of my life, which is actually the setting for most of my stories. I call it the Stephen King approach. If Maine can be that scary, Alabama can too. <laughs> right. I, I uh, mostly do uh, I do horror and uh, dark fantasy, a little bit of fi uh, uh, sci-fi. 
Um, I am looking into doing a fantasy novel. I, 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 that one of my friends told me if I do the true fantasy novel after everything else I've done, I will have hit the nerd trifecta and covered all the interests. And I was like, well, I got to do it now. There we go. It's a challenge. Try to do a little bit of everything. Okay. Do you have an idea for kind of a fantasy world that you would like to do? I actually do. Um, it's, it's actually a, it's, it's a story I've had in my mind for quite a while. And it's actually a story where a necromancer is actually the hero of the story, which you don't really see in fantasy very much. And uh, it involves an evil spirit called the Black Queen, which comes back and possesses someone and raises an army and just starts marching across the land, destroying everything. And uh, I wanted to name it. uh, I, I love this song. I'm giving away a secret here. I do uh, a lot of giveaways when I do book takeovers, and I'll ask people, like, name one of my two favorite Queen songs, and they never get them because they're real off-the-wall ones. (laughs) And (laughs) one of them, which is what I want to use for the title of this book, is The March of the Black Queen. Oh, okay. That'd be a cool title. And I think it'd be cool to see a necromancer getting actually represented as, you know, not the villain necessarily. It's like, you know, necromancers have a pretty bad name. Mm-hmm. For good reason. So, so, you know, I try to go against tropes a little bit. There we go. Well, uh, your uh, newest book that, that we're here to kind of talk about is called Talon. Uh, it's the Talon series, correct? And the book's called The Spider's yep. Web? Yes, Talon the Spider's Web. It's the first edition of, honestly, in my mind, I have about a 15-book series planned out. Oh, Wow. I have five different story arcs that are three books apiece is the way I see it. And it starts off as it should. It starts off small and um, the the actions in this very first book start a snowball rolling down the mountain that can't be stopped. There's even a character who comes out and kind of warns. Uh, the main character, Nikki, who's the vampire that's the focus of the story. If you go down this road, some roads you can't turn around from, and he goes ahead and makes the decision to do it anyway. And uh, it's a uh, it's a situation where a vampire actually trying to do a good deed is actually going to be the cause of that starts the domino effect that actually leads to all out Armageddon. Oh, okay. So if it's five different story arcs making up the, this 15 books, does that mean it's going to be five different trilogies and all the trilogies make up one big story? Yeah, that, that's, that is the general idea. The, the first story arc, uh, deals with a, uh, a biker and his family, and this biker is a uh, has made a deal with the demon Baphomet. So he's he has uh, like the equivalent. If anyone's played Dungeons and Dragons, like stone skin, you can't penetrate his skin. And uh, it all deals with him trying to get revenge for a member of his family that the vampire killed, and didn't think there'd be any ramifications from. So that's that story arc. The second story arc deals with uh, more directly with Baphomet, but will include the Knights Templar, oh. and will have a there will be a Talon the Holy Grail story written in there. I'm using all of the uh, iconic uh, relics and things that you would expect from uh, the Christian and the religious mythos. So that's the second one. The third one is uh, a vampire civil war because I have two kinds of vampires in my world. I have ones that were born vampires. It's a little similar. Blade had a similar setup. And then the ones that were mortal and that were turned. And the purebloods and the mortals do not like each other at all. So there's going to be a huge war between... There's also 13 clans of uh, pureblood vampires... And there's going to be a huge war breakout. So that's what that trilogy is. The trilogy after that is called the Hell Games. And actually will show Nikki being forced into a deal he doesn't want to make with Lucifer to represent him in what is basically um, 
like an Olympics event held by hell every thousand years. It's oh, okay. a big deal. They 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 bet on it. The demons pick champions, um, and then they are the the contestants are laid out a series of events. The better you do, the better you score. And each person that's in it generally has a deal with whoever's picked them as champion. So if this person wins, they're fighting to get maybe a loved one resurrected or might be doing it for power, for gold, for whatever. Everyone has their different reasons for being in the games. Okay. So that's that story is, is uh, the Hell Games, and I believe that's four. And then the fifth one would actually be the Armageddon and the Apocalypse art, which I'm going to try to – I'm not going strictly by Revelations, but I'm going to try to tie enough things in that it will connect to it. I'm not doing a like a verbatim – Seven-Headed Beast came out of the – what you know, no, I'm not doing a verbatim – uh, telling of John, but like I am going to use some of the elements of it, and we'll have the Antichrist. Um, quite probably, I hope will be a surprise to people uh, when the Antichrist gets revealed and things. And uh, yeah, so it's five trilogies, one big story arc, and to go on top of that, um, I've put a few single stories out because I I, I start the story and a prologue with his origin, and then it jumps forward. It, the origin explains to you why he became so bitter and vicious. And when, and when you see it, you'll understand. I think anybody will at least sympathize, like, yeah, I'd be mad too. And, and then it jumps forward to 1999, where he is now a solitary vampire. He's not with his sire or anyone else. And that's where the story really starts. But I'm using that 400-year gap to write prequels. And I'm not doing them in any particular order. I'm just going through and saying, like, like I went and did one that will be out in November of next year, which is actually a novella. And it will deal with him meeting Elizabeth Bathory, the blood countess from history. Okay. Um, there, there's plenty of side stories. I've got like other characters that have uh, popped up. Some of their pa- like uh, there's a doctor and this demon that pop up in the second Talon book. Their origin story can actually be found in the Chasing Fireflies romance anthology. Oh, okay. You know, so their backstory is in that. There's okay. a demon th- that's very prominent through the entire series that. Uh, shows up in a story which is going to be coming out, I think, at the end of the month in a collection called uh, Demons, Devils, and Denizens of Hell. Uh, P. Mattern ran that anthology, and so that ties in. Uh, there's a second story. They did a, they're doing a second one already planned in it. I sent the story in, and that demon who um, actually will break the fourth wall in the first story, which... Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to see how that goes. I actually, he actually hosts the next story for the the second one in the <laughs> anthology, where he's not actually involved in it, but he's just like sitting around sipping tea, starts talking to you, the reader, and is he, he's basically my he's turned into my crypt keeper. Right, okay. it's what he's done. He's just like, and here's another story of some demons and some people who turned the wrong way, and yada yada yada. And it sounds so, like. like Sounds like you've got your hands full with the series. Sounds like you're you're gonna have a lot going on with it. I I want there to be enough. I love hiding Easter eggs, right? And I love finding Easter eggs. I guess that's really where it started. I would love watching a series or reading a book and then catch a reference to, oh my gosh, this is talking about something that happened in this book or this story. And and ties everything together. I love little thread weaving that thread that just kind of brings everything where everything's connected. Right. And I want people to and like the standalone like these anthology stories, you don't have to know anything about Talon to read the story and enjoy the story. But if you do, you may get a little extra information you didn't know. You may get glimpses into 
oh my gosh, in this story, like when he talks about this, he's talking about what happened in the book over here, a page this, and that's a reference to this short story in this anthology over here. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I like to do, I, I like to be complicated, I guess. I can't be simple. I have to <laughs> put it everywhere. That's awesome. Um, well, can, can you kind of give us the, the little non-spoiler book blurb on what Talon the spider web's, uh, Spider's Web is about? Without spoiling too much, yeah. The Spider's Web is, as I said, it's, it's a 99, and this vampire has gone... He's only been freed and by himself for about six, seven decades at this point. So he's still learning kind of to live on his own. And he just happens to spot this certain uh, individual who's – I have where my vampires have different powers. Mm-hmm. Like Some are more empathic. Some are faster. Some – you know, it's, everything's different. They're not exact. They're not carbon copies of each other. And – uh, Nikki's talent, one of his is he picks up auras. He can feel them. He can't see them, but he can feel them. And he sees this guy and he just says, this guy's aura felt black, like demonic, like something's bad up with this guy. And so mm-hmm. that was the guy he decided he wanted to play with and torture he still likes torture. The hero of the book is still a bit sinister. He's a bit of an anti-hero. And he follows this guy home. And while he's stalking the, the place out to get this guy, he ends up seeing a car pulls up and a girl gets out who looks just like his little sister who was murdered in front of him. Mm-hmm. And he is completely blocked like his humanity out like that part of his life he doesn't even think about he tries to just completely keep that like that didn't exist and he comes face to face with this girl who sort of breaks pandora's box open if you will and sort of changes his it, it took him back to when he was human. It made him start remembering what it was like to be a mortal and and watching his sister die and how helpless he felt. And he decides the the good deed by the vampire that leads to this tragic uh, ending is he decides he's going to try to save this girl because he can't stand to see his little – someone who looks like his little sister. He can't stand to see his little sister die twice. Mm-hmm. He can't do it. And that starts him down a road, which leads him to meeting different people, which leads him to meeting up with some other people. And it, like I said, it's the first domino in the uh, in the chain of events. And he does end up meeting uh, not 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 the girl that looks like his sister, because that would be kind of creepy. But he does meet and uh, have a love interest in the story that just kind of. He gets stuck in a dilemma where he, uh, he, he, he he's bound by vampire law to kill someone, but he owes this person his life. So, And he just decides to say, screw the rules. And that also starts bringing down a lot of the trouble that comes later on. Okay. So there, there's action in the book. There's a little bit of paranormal romance in the book. There's... Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of little touches of comedy, and uh, uh, I watched a lot of Joss Whedon. So some of that uh, being able to throw funny things into serious situations. Old old Buffy and Angel fan I was, and I use some of that. There's a lot of little like 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 he's trying to uh, bar like he he's trying to get a car from this woman, and he unfortunately had to like subdue her g- gently. He didn't hurt her. But he was like, I know, I shouldn't have scared the old lady. But he's like, what was I going to do? You know, uh, you know, excuse me, ma'am, I need your car for official vampire business. Right. Hand her my Bella Lugosi fan club membership card. Look, I've got my Dracula decoder ring on. I'm totally legit. I'll be back with the car. You know, it, that's an internal monologue he has because he's reflecting on it. He's like, look, I'm sorry I scared her, but what, what was I going to do? So, so what what genre does does Talon the Spider's Web? Uh, um, it's a little mashup. Like I said, it's sort of it's dark fan, it's dark urban fantasy with action and some uh, some paranormal romance in it. 
so so before you before this series came out you you wrote more horror stories so did you have uh was it easy switching from the horror genre to this kind of dark fantasy urban setting? I actually did I actually did the dark fantasy first this, oh, did this story actually um is about 15 years old and I, I worked on it for about five years finding my voice writing and when I finally kind of got it about where it was starting to work, I went legally blind and I had to drop it for 10 years. And two years ago I had eye surgery, hip, hip, hooray. Right. And now all I need is reading glasses and I can see again. And I've been writing, uh, again, professionally for about two years. And I've had three novels, three magazines and about six anthologies. Wow. That I've been in. So it just hit. Like when it started happening, it just started happening fast. Okay. So I actually did the dark fantasy first and I did the horror as an experiment because a friend said she was doing a horror anthology and I was like, well, I've never done horror. I mean, I write about things that are scary, but the story itself isn't really a scary story. It's more of an action adventure kind of tale. I said, I'll, I'll try to do it from the other perspective. As I've always done, I've always done it from the vampire's perspective. So you know, mm-hmm. I was like, let me let me let me let me be the victim for a little bit, and I I wrote the story up. It was a paranormal haunting. I sent it to her, nervous as just all heck mm-hmm. on what she would say. My first horror story I've ever tried to write. Like even as a teenager, like I never wrote no BS horror story for fun. This is the first time I've ever tried horror, and. It took her two days to get back to me. And when she came back the the second day, it was in the morning and she sent me a message and it was just like, screw you. And I was like, what? (laughs) What did I do? She said, I could not walk by a mirror without freaking out last night. And I had to sleep with the light on because I read that story of yours at about midnight and I was like, so I did good? She said, <laughs> yes, and screw you for it. <laughs> That's and I was funny. like, all right, okay. That's and hilarious. When once that happened, I just started putting in for horror anthologies, and I, I've made most of them. I've I've sent stories off for. Wow. I even I even have like my own collection of uh, a combination of ones that I got the rights back to. And uh, some that I just I uh, wrote as I went along is like standalone shorts. Mm-hmm. I put some of them in there with some unpublished material, and uh, called it Alabama Nightmares and Urban Legends. And uh, about about half the stories are actually based on urban legends in the state, like the ghost hitchhiker on Highway Five. Oh, that's cool. The ghost of Condi Cunningham, who's supposed to haunt the. Uh, dormitory in Montevallo because she burned alive there when she in the 20s uh the banger cave witch uh broken down bryce asylum you know these are all real places that are supposed to be haunted and have these histories and um i write uh fictional stories based off of the legends and tell the legends in the stories oh okay well do you have a uh do you have an excerpt from Tal on the Spider's Web that you can read for my listeners so they can kind of hear what the story sounds like? Yeah, I can give them a little taste. Um, okay. I actually picked the scene where the vampire, uh, Nikki, who is the star of our show, um, came to see um, that girl that looked like his sister and his reaction to it. Okay. Because this, this is the pivotal, uh, the, a pivotal like swing in his personality and in the series. Okay. And it's, it's about, mm, about two paragraphs. It's, it's not too long. So, <clears throat> pulling a tiny silhouette out of the back seat, the fat man slammed the door shut. At first, I couldn't see her. But once I laid my eyes on her, my whole world turned upside down. If my heart still beat, it surely would have stopped. Oh, my dear God, I thought. That can't be her. She's dead. I was there. I buried her. That can't be. That just can't be. I forced myself to say a name I hadn't so much as dared whisper in centuries. Lizzie. 
I felt like I looked deep into my past and stared at a ghost who had long haunted me in the back of my mind. I thought I had laid this nightmare to rest, but I was wrong. Oh, brother, was I wrong. My sister, Lizzie, is someone I have always loved, but for my own sanity, I am ashamed to admit I had tried to forget her. Her memory evoked too much pain. As I stood in Spider's yard, staring at a girl who looked like my dead sister, I wasn't a vampire or the cold-blooded killer my sire had raised. In that moment, I had become a scared 17-year-old boy tied to a tree on Croatoan Island, watching my little sister freeze to death all over again. Staring on in disbelief, I felt a teardrop fall from my eye, the first I cried since being reborn as a vampire. Wow, I like it. That was very good. Um, So you said the story... Uh, the story takes place in 1999. Um, how many years will this, the whole series, the 15 books, how many years will it span? Wow. I'm thinking I will probably get it very close to modern. Though I will be writing a little bit of alt history. Things will be a little bit different than uh, uh, the history that we know. But it'll probably, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to at least be a decade if it doesn't run close to maybe 20 years like the hell games could take okay a couple of years themselves just to write it's it, it's it's going to be a i know i'm trying to tackle lord of the rings it, it looks <laughs> like it's such a big project but i've had a long time to think about this and plot right. things out and like the 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 first trilogy honestly um was is simply the first book I wrote broken apart and then supplemented to fill things out so I didn't rush through it as quickly because there was so much going on and I was like oh my gosh you know this character um needs to be fleshed out a lot more she's so much more of 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 a antagonist that uh, she needs to be featured, and 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 the one I'm talking about is actually uh, a girl named Harmony who will not show up until um, the third book. But she's going to be out in a couple of anthologies, and some people want to check out her uh, before she shows up in the series. And she is an actual uh, a Catholic vampire slayer, and the Catholics call them birds of prey. Oh, nice. Do you I'm have a Star Trek fan? Yeah, I totally, <laughs> totally tipping my head to the, the Star Trek there, but Birds of Prey, and yeah. But go ahead with your question. Do you have a favorite character that you enjoy writing the most, or or is Nikki the main character your uh, your favorite one? Mm, I do love Nikki, but um, it might be a toss up between either this. Demon that plays a major role, the one that is turned into my Crypt Keeper, uh, which is Mephistopheles, who is this incredibly charming, if you ever need a favor, he's the guy, and he's not really evil, he's not really good, he's just kind of, he's purely neutral. He mm-hmm. just helps move people for both sides around. He's a great character. And there's another one that I really enjoy, which is... Uh, will pop up here and there and gets mentioned in the first book, which is an old friend of Nikki's when he first uh, started running with humans is a guy by the name of Jonathan J. Faust uh, who played a harmonica and uh, was into the crime scene in New Orleans back in the 1930s. He's a fun character. Oh, very nice. I love them all, though. They're my babies. You know, no, like, I, I love them all. They, they've all got their own ups and downs. And both of those characters were helped, inspired by my friend Tony McGill. I want to give a shout out to him. He's my dungeon master when I play D and D, and he helps me smash story ideas together. And he's a wonderful help. Like I cannot thank that man enough. Um, so I read in an interview that you did that this story actually started out as a blog uh, for people that remember on MySpace. Oh my gosh, you <laughs> read that. Yes, that is actually true. So how hard was it going from 
the story starting out as a blog on MySpace to fleshing it out into a novel? Um, just the story grew um, on the blog, and I, I, some of the entry I did like diary entries when I first started it. Just like you know, this is what happened to me today. Oh, this happened, and the story just started growing and started growing, and and I added characters and. As I was writing them, it was like the characters grew from these flat two dimensional people on paper to 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 much more living, breathing people. And I was like, Oh my gosh, they would react so differently. I I know how they would react now to these situations a little bit different than the way I had them do it. And so I I scrapped what I had and kept the same concept and just kept tweaking it and changing it and fleshing it out. And like I said, by the time I also lost this manuscript, like about eight times. Oh no. Cause this was before the cloud and before, uh, thumb drives. And it was basically get a computer, write as much as you can and pray you can finish before, uh, the computer crashes and you loses it because when I started this, the files were so big that I couldn't even email them like to myself to put it in that cloud as you know an email attachment. And so, of course, that did give me the advantage of that the last time I started it, I really knew the first six to eight chapters of the book. Oh, okay, like I could write those with my eyes closed. Like I could just, <laughs> yeah, I've done this so many times, <laughs> and it was just finishing it out was the uh, the new part. But as I said, when I got done with it, and I looked at it, and I was like, this is actually way bigger stories going on. I need to stretch it out. So that one book turned into three. Very nice. And now those three books have turned into fifteen. Yes, that is. I will be writing <laughs> this when I am old and gray and. Hopefully, I'll 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 have the like people will be harassing me like they do the Game of Thrones guy. When's the next book coming? Well, That's quit, right. Quit tweet me, and I would stop it. You know, um, hopefully. So, so do you remember what inspired the series? I I think when I started this, the character, the main one of the things about Nikki that I think I felt connected to was, um. I, I'd hit like a couple rough spots in my life. I, I, I had a car wreck. I ended up being disabled. It took several years to get on disability. So I was living with no money. I had um, some abusive people in my family that were very, very negative and were not helping at all. And I had this had had a lot of rage in me at times because it was just a really hard time. And I said some things and I did some things that I wasn't happy about that I felt guilt over. And I kind of transferred it into Nikki um, that I want to do better. I want to be a good man, but I've got all this stuff that I have to atone for. And, and he's the same way. Like he, like the moment I just read where he sees the sister, this is the moment where he tries to start doing better. And it just leads him into just more and more messes. And, but he's, he's trying, he's trying, you know, he, he, he had like 400 years of being just a horrible, I will not lie. He was a horrible person. Mm -hmm in the time he was with his sire, but his sire fueled that she loved chaos and mayhem and suffering and not just killing people, but like make them suffer when you kill them. I mean, that was one of her lessons that she taught and he went through all those years of doing these terrible things and he's trying to find redemption. And I think at that time I was trying to find redemption okay. and I feel like I've, I've, I, I found mine. I've made my peace and I've, I've kind of, I, my Zen is good or whatever you want to call it now. You know, I've, I'm in a much better place. I've, I've stabilized. I came out the other end of the tunnel and I came out stronger for it where a lot of people did not And, uh, God rest them. I've buried so many people I know in, in my life. It's, it's just terrible, but you know, now Nikki has to go through, I guess what I went through. Mm -hmm. Um, he, I, I was looking for redemption. He was looking for it. I found my own. Now I have to write how he 
does or how either he finds his or he fails to. You never know. You know, I'm not going to give it away. Right. Uh, you know, does he fully, you know, redeem himself? Does he fall back to his old habits? It's part of the, you know, there's a constant battle within him. And I think we all have that, you know, someone just does a jerk thing in front of you. You know, you have the instant, that instinct to be like, I ought to get out at night. No, I know better. Right. Well, well, he he goes through that, except his is a little bit more severe than what we would do. We would yell. He would probably drag them in the alley and (laughs) hack them up. That's right. So, so it's really, there's actually a story of redemption and he actually, um, I guess minor spoiler down the road, I've already mentioned that he has a contact with Lucifer. He also will have contact with God himself. Oh, okay. And and yet they're both trying to get him to play on their side. So it's one of those. It's a little bit. So like, there's a big theme of redemption. And would God use someone as you know the guy's a demon? So he's a blasphemy. He's murdered. He's a sinner. This terrible, terrible person. And maybe use them for something good later in the end, or does the devil win and pull him over in the story? To, you know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. It's got to. It's got to play out. Um. Some some authors when they write stories are trying to deliver a certain message um, in their stories, and some authors are just writing stories to entertain you. Um, are you trying to deliver any kind of? message with this series or is this just a series meant to uh entertain you i personally am more about the ride than maybe the final destination Mm -hmm. is 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 uh is is more important uh though if you look there are some things that you could point at and pull out of it but it's not like an intentional it's just uh it's just part of the story, you know. Uh, everyone's uh, everyone gets to interpret a book the way they want to, and if they want to focus on the redemption story, if they want to focus on there, there are different messages that can come through and be interpreted. But uh, maybe they're intentional, maybe they're not. But I, I, I am writing it though, truthfully, more for the uh, it's the ride, okay. like life. It's not about where you end up. We all end up in the same place one day it's it's what you do between now and the stopping point to me that matters and enjoy it look around see what you're doing enjoy life you know it's a roller coaster but you're strapped in i mean there's two ways to ride a roller coaster you either sit there and be miserable or or you hit the loop de loop and you just throw your arms up in the air and scream and try to enjoy wherever it's taking you because it's out of my hands just ride it out okay. and i'd rather i'd rather try to go that way well, here at 30 Minute Author Interviews and The Legendarium, we're kind of known for one question. And that question is A penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? I see all you people at home not leaving reviews. I see your Kindle. <laughs> I see your freaking Kindle, man. I see you got that story in there, man. You read that story. I saw your KDP pages, man. Why don't you leave a freaking review? We need reviews, people. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's that's a good one right there. <laughs> um, and then uh, the one question I kind of like to end each episode on is: Before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with our listeners? For writing or for life, um, this goes a little bit to everything, but like especially to the younger writers that are trying to get in the business, keep writing. Like even if. If you e- even if you think some of your stuff sucks, keep writing, keep working, keep trying to get it better, keep submitting. You never know how close you are to you know they don't they it it, it could have been oh you were like oh you were the first one cut from being admitted into the magazine or the anthology or whatever. Don't give up on what you're doing, no matter what it is. If you have a dream, chase it because I mean, what is the point of living if at the end of it all, you don't have some damn good stories to tell to people at the end. So go for your dreams, live, enjoy life. Don't take stuff for granted. I think that's some great advice. Uh, where can our listeners go if they would like to learn more about you or the books that you have written? 
Uh, two main places, I would say. Uh, my Facebook page is facebook.com slash JMW, the number two, and the word author. Um, on Amazon, to, see my, to keep up with my releases, it's amazon.com slash author slash JMW2 author. And on Twitter, it's the same thing, twitter.com slash JMW2 author. Try to keep it themed. Keep it simple. Well, there we go. We will put links to all of those over in the show notes at legendarium.com. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Oh, I loved it. Thank you for having me. Would love to come back sometime. Yeah, it was fun. We'll have to do it again. That is all the time that we have for this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope you tune in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for another great author interview. Don't forget to head on over to legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, you're going to find the giveaway where J. Michael Wright II is giving two people the chance to win an ebook copy of Talon the Spider's Web. Also in the show notes, you're going to find the link to our sponsor, the Galactic Satori Chronicles. Check them out and let them know that you heard about them right here on 30-Minute Author Interviews. And don't miss another episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. You can subscribe to the podcast on Google Play, iTunes, YouTube, and wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review. It helps us out. I would also like to thank a few of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank Third Scribe, Maggie Stewart Grant and Nick Breaker. They're supporting 30 minute author interviews through Patreon. They are also receiving the Patreon only podcast 10 questions with. Visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30 minute author interviews for as little as a dollar a month. Until next time, stay legendary.